Welcome to the uh, 1934. <laughs> there is 903rd meeting of the Edmonton Telescope Makers of Boston. Thank you. And we'll start right in. We've got keynote speakers Tom Lepisto and Jean LeBeau, and they're going to talk about her husband. Howard's adventure in Antarctica with me. I did put IGY this time, not IGA. That's a story. Let's press the right buttons. All right, we'll start with uh, Philippine, the Secretary's report. By the way, to make money, we're going to start using sponsors. It'll be the Secretary's report sponsored by Hannaford Supermarket. Yeah. <laughs> summary of the October 12, 2017 ATMA meeting held at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Club President Glenn Chapel called the meeting to order at 8 p.m. Mario Mata gave a brief presentation on an occultation of Neptune's moon Triton by a distant bright star. Mario obtained light curve data of the occultation at his observatory in Gloucester, Mass. Other ground observers and NASA's Project Sophia also obtained light curve data, which will be used to calculate Triton size, position, temperature, atmospheric temperature, and density. Mario indicated a scientific paper will be forthcoming. The secretary report was read by Phil Levine. Highlights of the treasures report were read by Glenn Chapel. The membership report was read by Chris Elledge. The observing report was given by Glenn Chapel. Announcements. A number of astronomy-related events were held in Lowell, Mass. during October. At the Pollock Memorial Library, there was a talk by David Sobel, author of Glass Universe, which was about the woman computers who worked analyzing the Harvard Glass Photographic Plate Collection uh, from the late 1800s to early 1900s. Also in October, Lindsay Smith, curator of the Harvard Glass Plate Collection, gave a presentation about Project Dash. Uh, see the newsletter for hyperlinks and more details. A play, Silent Sky, about the women Harvard computers is running from October 18 to November 12 at the Lowell Merrimack Theater. There was an open house at MIT Haystack, October 18. Glenn Chapel and Bruce Berger participated and set up telescopes. A mini Messier Marathon was held at the Westford Clubhouse, October 21, hosted by Rich Nugent of the Observing Committee. The International Dark Sky Association will be holding their annual meeting in Boston, November 10 through 12. Old business. John Reed informed the membership he collected $250 to be donated to Atmob from selling eclipse glasses at a dollar each. Bernie Volts indicated a surplus of $2,450 left over from the club. A clip trip will be donated to Atmob. New business. Paul Valelli brought books to the October meeting, which were donated by club member Steve Mark. Voluntary contributions of $35 will be donated to Atmob. The guest speaker of the evening, Tom Calderwood, gave a presentation entitled Building the 100-Inch Telescope in Boston. Tom discussed the Boston connection to the construction of the 100-inch Cooker Telescope located on Mount Wilson in Pasadena, California. Peter Schwab, MIT Professor Emeritus, was project manager for constructing the mechanical mount for the telescope 1913-1916 at the Quincy Four River Shipyard. Schwab's responsibilities include engineering design, quality assurance, subcontractor selection, cost tracking, troubleshooting, logistics, and not the least motivation of staff at the Four River Shipyard. Hooker Telescope first light occurred November 2nd, 1917. Historic discoveries were made with the Hooker Telescope. Edwin Hubble, using a photographic glass plate taken with the Hooker Telescope, was able to identify a septiate variable star in what was then called the Andromeda Nebula. In the early 1900s, there was debate among astronomers whether the Milky Way galaxy comprised the whole universe or whether the universe contained numerous island galaxies. In 1924, Hubble utilized the period luminosity relationship of Cepheid variable stars discovered by one of the Harvard woman computers, Henrietta Leavitt. Leavitt's results were published in Harvard College Observatory Circular 173 in 1912. Leavitt determined there was a correlation between Cepheid variable star period and overall brightness. The more luminous septiates had longer periods of variability. 
Other astronomers, Ignar Hertzsprung and Carlo Shapley, calibrated the Levitt Law so that Cepheids could then be used as standard candle distance indicators. <coughs> Hubble using the Levitt Law was able to determine <coughs> that the Andromeda Nebula was actually a separate, very distant galaxy and not part of the Milky Way. Refreshments for the evening were provided by Bernie Pusicki. Glenn Chapel adjourned the meeting at 9.30. Observing committee report. I know I always do this every time. I get this thing set up and I never send you the PowerPoint. You can jump in if you, you want. You can leave my picture up there if you want. But <coughs> well, it's better looking than me, so. <laughs> that for sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> where do you park your car? <laughs> Upcoming sky events. For this is between now and our next meeting, December 14th, on Monday, November 3rd. Uh, Venus and Jupiter will be less than one half a degree apart in the morning sky. And if you've ever seen a Venus-Jupiter conjunction, you know it's a really spectacular sight. It just means you've got to get up early in the morning to see that. On the 23rd of the month, Mercury will be at its greatest eastern or evening elongation. You've got to look low in the southwest 30 minutes after sunset. But apparently this will be a fairly favorable one. Usually the, the ones in the fall can be. And so it's a possibility. It's not going to be a great one. The ones we like are the ones in the spring. That's when you get a really good uh, elongation. Uh, Chris wanted me to put this down. I'm glad he did. How many of you have ever seen the Lunar X? It really is a remarkable sight. and It's so obvious once you see it. It's visible about four hours every month. And of course, some of those months are when the moon is in another part. It's not visible from our sky. So you might see it every three or four months. It just happens that on Saturday, November 25th, from 7.46 right until moonset, this Lunar X is visible. It's right near the Terminator. There's also a letter Y up there as well. And uh, the thing about that is that's also an observer, a night, observing night at the clubhouse, so we'll hope for clear skies. So that's definitely worth looking for. And then finally, Wednesday, Thursday, December 13th and 14th, that's essentially the night before our next meeting, the Gemini meteors will be kicking into high gear. You can see up to 100 an hour. The moon will be out of the way, so that will be a definitely favorable event. As far as the observer's challenge, what the LVAS has come up this month is uh, NGC 772. The article is in our newsletter already. Mario took a nice photograph. It's unusual. It has an, an arm that's been kind of stretched out. And up here, it's surrounded by some galaxies, and apparently there's an interaction. That arm actually tends to go up toward this galaxy. So there's some distortion going on there. And that's, there's also, I think, this one right here is NGC uh, 70, 770. So they are interconnected galaxies, this whole area. So it's a good project to look for. It's about 11th magnitude, 10.3, 11th. Sue French Fan Club. She also presents a couple of galaxies. She's covering basically the, uh, uh, the great square of Pegasus and the galaxies that are found within that area. And the one I thought would be most interesting is NGC 7741. It's a spiral barred galaxy in Pegasus. This is the one that's 11th magnitude. You definitely see the bar right here. And uh, that might be a nice target at the clubhouse. I don't know how well we'll do again with the skies we have out in Westford, but it's worth a shot. Uh, <laughs> good picture of me. I could, that's the best picture I could find. I had to Google to get a picture, but uh, I picked up some objects and I would have done double steps to get back at Steve. But I wanted a nice mix of objects that, uh, for a wide range of viewing. And I picked up uh, Epsilon Pegasi. I call it the Wiggle Star. I think John Herschel called it the Pendulum Star. And I don't know how well you can see that from where you're seated. Uh, but there's the main star. It's a K giant type of star. I believe it's about 700 light years away. It's a long distance off and it's still about two and a half magnitude. I didn't know this. I was doing some quick re research. It's the brightest star in Pegasus. I would always assume the Alpha star is, but the Alpha star is not. And uh, the thing about this, though, is if you get this, get this in the uh, eyepiece, jiggle the telescope so these stars go parallel to each other. And the fainter star seems to do this type of thing. An oscillation. That's why it gets known as the pendulum as a pendulum star because it looks like the pendulum on our grandfather's clock. It's a weird effect, and Herschel said it was because the brighter star, when you change direction, the, the eye can pick that up, but it doesn't see the fainter star quite as quickly. So the fainter star seems to lag behind. It's really kind of a funny thing when you're jiggling that telescope. You see this little star wobbling like crazy. 
I then went for pair of naked eye variable stars. And I know sometimes it's like pulling teeth, getting people to be interested in variable stars. But Delta Cepheus, they're both found right in this corner of Cepheus. Uh, Delta Cepheus is part of a nice triangle right in the corner of Cepheus. It's a Cepheid variable star. Of course, it's famous as being the, kind of the, one of the measures for finding out how far away galaxies and things are the Cepheid variables. It ranges from about 3.4 to 4.4. So the thing is, what makes this star so great is this star is about as bright as delta when bright is at max when delta is at maximum. This star is about as bright as delta when it's at minimum. And if you ever look at this triangle, you can tell right away there's a definite distance difference between these two. So you watch delta night after night. The series, the cycle takes about five days for the whole thing. It takes about a day to go from 4.4 .4 up to 3.4, and then about four days to go back down. And I followed the star over a course of a summer one time. It's just amazing. You definitely can see the difference if you look at this star every time you go out. Sometimes I used to use this as a warm-up. If I got my scope set up and I'm letting it cool down anyway, I just look at Delta Cepi, I just see what it's doing. I'm also waiting for my eyes to get dark adapted. So anybody can do this. I even, when Haystack used to have their summer program, uh, I did one with some, uh, some of the kids here. This is middle school age kids. And I had some do a project on Delta Cephei. And one of the girls, she was a sixth grader. And I don't want to get into math, but you, you know, if, you try to, if you just try to do a, a time run or a series run of the star, you might have brightness here, five days later here. You know, you get, it's kind of sloppy, but you can kind of mathematically fold the light curve of the star mathematically and you can put all these plots together and she got a beautiful plot of the star rising slowly and then an abrupt drop and that was again a 12 year old girl so uh, if a middle school kid can do this hopefully any of us can do it the other one is Herschel's Garnet star this is Mu Cephei and this star is a giant it's typically around four to six magnitude uh, it's a red carbon star, so if you have binoculars, it's kind of nice to look at it. Although when I looked at it, typically I see it more as kind of an orangey color than the red, but uh, it's still, a, it's a neat one to watch month after month, because this one has a slow change. It's, a, it's an irregular type of star. And finally, I want to get one deep sky in to keep Steve happy. Uh, 7789, what can you tell us about 7789? I put you on the spot here, but I know you'd know anyway. It's not deep enough. <laughs> oh. Where do you park your car? It's, a, it's being towed. <laughs> it's a binocular object, actually. Yeah. We can be large binoculars on a good dark sky, but I think what we noticed last year when we looked at 7789 is when it was lower in the east or in the west, it's very washed out in moderately light blue yeah, skies. Yeah. When it's high up, it's dazzling. It's really impressive. Yeah. So a modest sized telescope, 8 to 12 inches, does a great job on yeah. that open cluster. Hundreds of members. It's, it's almost really like a cross. Low power, too, low magnification. Because yeah, I think it's about a, a half moon diameter across, about 15 arc minutes or so. About a thousand stars. It's almost, the, the, it's a, basically, it's categorized as a rich open cluster. You can almost look <coughs> at it as a very poor globular cluster, but it is a remarkable <coughs> sight. And that uh, was discovered by Herschel, but not. William Hurst, this is his uh, sister Carolyn, and in fact its nickname is uh, Carolyn's Rose. So that's definitely a fantastic cluster to look at. Here's a picture here, and that's Rome, Cassiopeia, and that's Sigma right there. So it's right between those two stars, right on the edge of Cassiopeia, right over here. It doesn't show it on this map, but it's approximately in that location right there. So just go to the side of the W, and you'll find it. Yes? There is actually a known effect about the processing the, the speed with which your brain processes images uh, uh, in relation to brightness. Yeah. And one of the things you can do is when watching television, like <coughs> football, if you put a neutral density filter over one eye, that causes the successive images on the TV to be processed at different times, then it pops into 3D, depending on which direction they're moving and which eye you cover. <laughs> you know, it's amazing the things you learn. <laughs> I was driving in, I was listening to a, a soft rock station, I like the 80s rock, and uh, they were talking about, and I maybe get this wrong, but you know how when you see a movie there are all these frames? Well, apparently our eye works like that, and we pick up about 60 frames every second. They were talking about the reaction speed of certain creatures. We get 60 of these images a second, and we react accordingly. 
A turtle gets about 15 images a second, which is why it's so slow. A house fly, it's 250 seconds, so you wonder why you can't swat that thing. <laughs> All right, let's get on to some astronomy again. Does anybody have any questions, comments, additions to the observing report? Yes? Carl Sagan's birthday is today. How old would he have been? Billions and billions. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have done the other myself. <laughs> That's why I invite John Olivier. A <laughs> couple of announcements. Uh, the International Dark Sky Association is having their annual meeting. It's right here in the Boston area, November 10th and 12th, which starts tomorrow. Is there anybody here that has further information they can pass on to the club? Well, I, I'll be attending. I don't really have. I, I downloaded the program. Okay. Um, and it's at the, on the Dalton Street, which is. Uh, I forget the name of the, the Hilton Back Bay, Boston. But anybody could go to IDA.org and get the necessary yes. information. And they're going to have a special, um, the normal registration fee is $150 mm -hmm. for the three days, but you can just go to the Saturday uh, event for $50 and they'll have exhibits of all the different illumination schemes. Unfortunately, President, ex-president, Clinton has already been there and gone, <laughs> and we won't be able to see him. So they have a senior citizen discount so we can all go? Or is I talked my way into one. Yes. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> all right, any other? Uh, and then the second thing is, uh, uh, Rich was kind enough to do a makeup since we were plowed out that day. We still showed up and just sat in the clubhouse. Although, uh, where's Al? Hmm? Right here. Al, there you are, right? No, no, no. How many did you see? You did pick up. We picked up about six objects that night. There was yeah, one sucker hole. There were four of us. Yeah. We, the week before, we had three months of clear skies all that one week. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, it got cloudy. There was some high overcast, um, serious overcast. But we, there was enough of a hole that we actually saw six messy objects. Yeah. Was, uh, uh, Joe Henry, Al, myself, and Andy Zucker. Um, so let's try it again. So Saturday, November 18th from 6 to midnight. Um, we get an extra hour to uh, yeah, that's to, right. to do some observing. I think by now we've lost the first eight on the list, but we'll we'll see if we can do it again. So if you're so inclined, dress warmly, come on up to the clubhouse, and uh, again I'll have plenty of charts and checklists, and we'll just see if we can knock a few out of the park. You know, it'll be pretty good. Maybe we'll look at seven, seven, eight, nine when we're doing. Oh. <laughs> hey, thanks for setting this up, by the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, and if you really want to stay up late, you can watch the Leonids. Yeah, you'll probably see about three or four an hour. Oh, yes. <laughs> I tell you what, we'll, we'll stay until we see the first Leonardo. That might be three or four in the morning, but at least something will happen. And, and I, I, while I'm standing up here, I'd like to make one more comment, not to plug double stars or anything like that. But, Go for it. Um, you know, recently I've started to do more observing when the moon is full. And I, I, I like deep sky objects, um, but they're kind of washed out. Uh, and so what I've turned to were double stars. And, and, and the best place I've found so far to start is your 100, 109 List your near star, double star marathon. Unless you're in marathon. You should check out some of those double stars. Some of them are really awesome. Some of those are really quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what I do when the moon is full. I just drag out a relatively small scope and, and look at double stars. It's kind of fun. Thanks for the plug. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. They're, they're really nice. <clears throat> All right. If you guys have any questions about that little messy thing, just see me after and we'll talk about it. Yes, Great, thanks. Oh. Glenn, I forgot to mention that one of the sponsors the IDA meeting is Wallace Observatory of oh. MIT, so they must be getting really concerned about the light pollution in Westbrook. Yeah, no doubt. I don't know what they can do about it by now. <coughs> yeah. Well, the thing we can't do is give up. We <coughs> talked to Mario and Kelly and how long they've been fighting. Yeah. Okay, old business. We have any old business or any updates? Yes, I mean. This is Star Party next week on Wednesday at the Butler School in Lowell. Okay. And that was points on the website, right? Has anybody besides me signed up for that? Bob, two. Three. Three people? Three, three people. Uh, we, uh, if, if history is any indicator, we could probably use a couple more scopes. Sometimes it gets pretty crowded there. Although it is pretty light. What's that? How do you sign up? Uh, on the website, you remember? Uh, it is now. Brand new. Um, Talk to Chris and yeah. Chris can sign you up. Okay. Yeah. Do you live up in that area? Uh, no, I work here. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'd love to have you. Okay. 
New business. <laughs> and I don't even remember who brought this up. Somebody was suggesting, you know, we have, have, have t-shirts and so forth. You can go online on our website and you can order some of these things. But uh, we never had a pin. I, who was it that brought that? I think somebody from Russia. I got an email from That's a Russian teenager that asked if we would send him a pin. He was huh. collecting the Strongly Club pins. Uh, I sent you an email. Yeah. Clint, we did have one at one time. It was a simple uh, aluminum square yeah. with ATMOV on it in blue anodizing. I'm just going to throw, the, they were a couple bucks, right? It's not that, Eileen, I was talking yeah. to Eileen, because you do the one for the Springfield, tel the Stellafane uh, search party there, the, uh, the observing thing. And they're not that expensive, are they? Uh, couple depends bucks. Depends on how many we order, but it's about $2. Yeah, that's not, uh, just a quick question. If, and I know some people wear them on their lapels, or you have your hats and stuff, things like that. If this were to be made available, how many would be interested in picking up a pin? I think it's good enough we might pursue this then. Okay, we'll look into that. All right, time for our guest speakers. Good. And yes. But I have an announcement too. Oh, that's right. I told you to tackle me if I forgot. Go ahead. Right. Uh, sad news, we lost Allison Doan, the former curator of the oh. Stacks, who she did address the club back in 2004. And uh, the she died a week ago Sunday, a burial, I believe, was in Canton on Saturday, but I believe it's going to be a private service now. There will be a public memorial service, so look for the announcement in the future. Okay. Any other? <laughs> yes. I just want to brag for 10 seconds. Oh, I scored oh, my oh. first album cover. <laughs> <laughs> Tennessee uh, saw my website and said, I want an eclipse on our next uh, next album cover, and so there it is. Congratulations. No, no, no. Find out if they'll sponsor our observing committee report. Yeah, I'll ask. What's the musician's name? Uh, it was Doug and Talisha Williams, um, and they're not bad, but they're they're a kind of you know small town uh, country music act. Yes, John. We've got a happy birthday card for Anna Hillier. Most of us have signed it. If anybody has it who wants to see me right afterwards, everybody's signatures on one little card. Next Friday she'll be 80 years old. She's in rehab having had a hip surgery uh, for the last three weeks ago, I believe. So she's doing all right. She's raising games with the staff. So it's <laughs> a good sign, of course. I got the card. Yes. four pictures after. Oh, all right. So let's go ahead and crank away. Then. Four that are coming up, right? By the way, while we're setting, I just want a little personal note here. That old-fashioned thing called the slide projector. <laughs> if you know me with technology, when PowerPoints first came out, I had nothing to do with them. In fact, when Jan and Maddie passed away and they had the memorial <coughs> for her, I mean, people from around the world came to this thing, and they had a PowerPoint presentation. They couldn't get it to work. Some type of computer glitch. And here again, you're people from around the world. So I saw it and said, I'll stick with my slide projector. So I gave a talk at the... Uh, Connecticut Star Party, this is probably 15 years ago now, and I gave the same spiel I just did you. I don't trust this modern technology, I'm going with that good old slide projector. I hit the button, I'd forgotten to plug it in, so that was one thing. <laughs> <laughs> but then once I plugged it in, third slide, jammed. So just in case, I get some tweezers. <laughs> what? There's one more slide, you should, yeah, I got it. Go okay, what did I just uh, do? Oh, the Meteor Man. This is our speaker for next month. He was at the uh, um, Astronomer's Conjunction out in Northfield, Mass. Last uh, was August, I guess. And he had, this is good because this will be the holidays when he shows up at December meeting. And he will sell meteors. I think that one's probably a half a million dollars. They don't come cheap. But he even had some from the Cherblunsky or 
What is it? Chernobyl? Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Whatever it is. Chernobyl, I keep. But anyway, he had some little chunks of that that were for sale. I don't think they were that expensive. I remember he was selling uh, Canyon Diablo meteorite chunks for like a dollar a gram. So for $35, they were fair about an inch across chunk of uh, meteorites. So he'll be here to talk about collecting meteorites and he'll have some for sale as well. So save your pennies because that'll be coming up next month. Now, Okay. Are there some more slides to follow? Or we yes, there will. We'll start more slides. Okay, do you want me to do the introduction now then? Yeah. Okay, I don't have a lot, but Tom Lapisto is our featured speaker along with uh, Howard's wife, Jean. And Howard and his wife live in Medford, right? Or Cambridge. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Jean lives in Cambridge Tom and Tom Lapisto lives in yes. Medford. Okay, and they're going to talk about Howard's adventure again. I did. A, I don't get rid of the IGA. Okay, I'm gonna hang up on that store. IGY. So I'll let them take over. And uh, Tom and Jean. I guess I'm amplified here. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm Tom Lapisto, uh, and this is Jean Laveau, Howard's wife. I'm Tom Lepisto. I'm a friend of Howard's for 25 years. Uh, we met initially through ski activity, but discovered we shared the, uh, the passion for astronomy and uh, the beauty of all that's in the sky. And uh, um, although I heard his tales of having traveled to Antarctica and he even showed many of the pictures we're going to see in a bit tonight, um, I really, there's a lot more of the story that I've uh, looked into recently, so as we uh, try to get this presentation together. So, to begin with Howard, as many of us knew him, uh, the observer, this from uh, this club's own trip to uh, the total eclipse in Egypt in March 2006, and his infamous collection of uh, telescopic equipment, which uh, I helped him pack up, pack up as the last bus was about to leave that day from the observer site in Egypt. Uh, uh, how many in the room were on that Egypt trip? I'm curious. Yeah, quite a few of you. And, uh, that was certainly a memorable experience. Well, long before that, um, Howard had uh, participated as a scientific observer in the activities of the IGY, and again, how many in the room remember the International Geophysical Year? I mean, I remember it, okay. Uh, happened technically 1957-58, Howard's activity extended into 1959 and early 1960. But these are the locations uh, Howard was engaged with uh, when he was in Antarctica. He spent a lot of time at Bird Station, uh, where he observed uh, the Aurora Australis. That was uh, one of his primary assignments. Uh, he got over to the larger U.S. American base in Antarctica at McMurdo Station, which is right next to the Ross Ice Shelf there. Also the Scott Base, uh, New Zealand's base. And in the room tonight uh, is a Brian uh, Stanford who uh, actually encountered Howard during that time in Antarctica, circa late 1959, say? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I point out the executive committee range there, a very remote, little visited location now in Antarctica, consisting of a few volcanic peaks because uh, Howard got into that range and in fact, uh, they named a mountain after him. Uh, over here, uh, a peak on Pine, <coughs> nice volcanic peak, uh, nearly 8,500 feet high, and uh, I think a very appropriate uh, monument to uh, the exploratory efforts there. Um, I put this in just a little background on the IGY and, and the involvement of auroral research. Um, this was what it was all about. Uh, filling in the gaps in knowledge about auroras, Arctic and Antarctic, and tracing the relationship between the two. So that's the activity Howard was involved with. And uh, the rest of the story will tell with his own pictures. So, okay. Okay, right. so we can turn the digital off. And Jean, uh, if you want to do a little introduction as we get these going. Okay, well, first of all, 
Um, thanks to Tom for filling in everything I couldn't do, not only after Howard died, but um, not being very well the last couple of weeks. And Tom really pitched in and did all the research, so thank you so much, Tom. You're welcome. Uh, Brian and uh, Jean know Howard longer than I do, because I was only married to him for 52 years, but you knew him five years before I met him. And so hats off to you. <laughs> um, we have been trying for months to put this on for you. And as Howard got weaker, we realized we couldn't do it. I kept talking to Glenn about it, and we kept thinking we could do it, but it couldn't happen. So this is posthumous, but we hope that it helps you understand what went on there. Um, he, uh, when I met him, was coming back from the Arctic, where he was studying the uh, aurora. And so at that point, of course, I knew nothing about the, Australia, the uh, Antarctic trip. So over the last 52 years, I've come to know a lot more. <laughs> so I hope you, I'm glad to share this with you. And we wanted to say we, um, our knowledge of what Howard was doing there is fragmentary. And anyone in the audience who recognizes any scientific instruments, knows anything about auroras or glaciology or seismology, uh, please feel free to uh, speak up and chip in because uh, we have we have as many questions. Uh, as answers about some of the things that are in uh, the pictures. So here is uh, Howard Laveau in his 20s, already the holder of uh, two Bachelor of Science degrees at this point, uh, but lived in California at that time, and that was where he uh, took off from to start his uh, Antarctic activity. Okay. <laughs> I didn't catch the Gene. Gene knew the car, I think. Do you know the car, Gene? Yeah, it was a Packard. A Packard. Uh, I didn't see the car, and it's, but I, I knew it. Now, Brian, if you can identify anything about this, we're indebted to you. We think this is perhaps a scene in New Zealand where I believe Howard passed through New Zealand both coming and going from Antarctica in his travels, and here, clearly, not the Antarctic yet, but. Uh, you know, a stop on the way. Um, but here we have some scenes there preparing the equipment that would be uh, installed and, and used uh, at Bird Station, I believe. Uh, you know, you're going to see more of these transparent domes later. And again, if anyone has any familiarity uh, with the types of equipment that we're seeing here, you, you know, may know more about it than we do. Uh, so, uh, move on. Uh, one piece that is identified here with a nice IGY uh, logo up there, no less, is uh, this is an auroral radar. And uh, make a note of a girder-like structure of that tower. It's, uh, it's going to pop up again a bit later. So, can you focus a little, Linda? See if, if that focus and see if it helps. Uh, the effort in that article was supported by the military bird. The Navy put a lot into the bird station, and it looks like the Air Force was involved in their trans that's good. Was involved in their transport getting there. <coughs> and we're assuming that this is perhaps arriving at uh, McMurdo at probably which is, you know, maybe the Grand Central Station of that part of Antarctica. Um, and the scene there at a the bigger, busier uh, American base in Antarctica. Uh, again, Brian, you might know this. I'm thinking this is a view of McMurdo from you know, up in the mountains above it. And shop bases just over the other side of the. Would that be like the Scott base? Well, it's oh. around the corner. Of it. Okay. But this would be McMurdo itself, an edge of the Ross ice shelf out there. So that is what it looked like uh, at the time. 
Uh, we, we see they moved moved the team into luxury accommodations <laughs> upon arrival. And uh, again, Brian, I don't know if you ever saw that facility or uh, would that have been at McMurdo? I'm, I'm kind of thinking McMurdo being on the Ross Ice Shelf. Logical place to build the Ross Yard. Yeah. Right. And uh, one thing to keep in mind, this kind of sunk in on me as I looked through the pictures, <coughs> was that uh, if you're seeing anything taken in sunlight, we're in the austral summer. We're thinking Antarctica, well south of the Antarctic Circle, the, you know, the land of the midnight sun. The sun is in the sky for half the year and, uh, and below the horizon the other half of the year, essentially. So Howard arrived during, we believe, Austral summer, probably late 1958, was there for a total of 15 months, so through the full cycle of seasons in Antarctica. Yeah. Uh, of course, you can't make a visit to Antarctica without seeing the penguins, and uh, again, they're mostly around the coastal area, so I'm assuming this would have been in that area of the McMurdo and uh, Scott bases during the time Howard spent there. I believe, believe this fellow is trying to get the penguin to pose for a picture. You can see a, a camera and, and be there. But, we uh, had one that came up to the base, at Scott Base, and mm -hmm. came in and stood up by the, the um, heating system <laughs> <laughs> and stayed there for. For a day. Well, you know, Dynamo's penguins, they just act like they own the place. <laughs> okay. Um, this, I assume, is a fairly typical example of that kind of construction at the base, uh, you know, uh, emphasis on function. <laughs> and I guess this is, uh, you know, in uh, an office building, Antarctic style. Uh, there's Howard himself. Again, I would assume that's on the edge of the Ross Sea, Ross, Ross Ice Shelf, mm -hmm. among some of the supplies they, uh, they used around the base. But uh, it's... The Ere Erebus is the mountain. Okay, or Mount Erebus in the distance. Uh, is it's that an active true? volcano. Uh-huh. Is that the highest in Antarctica, too? Or? No. 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 Yeah, I guess plenty of volcanic mountains. Vincent down. Massive is the highest. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> interesting place. I guess in Antarctica, somebody might pop up from a hole in the snow, you know, uh, if you were in the vicinity of a, a base at least. And uh, the snow keeps coming down in the chimneys. Right. Right. And certainly, as the next slide will show, Linda, uh, going, going into the ice to some depth. <coughs> We're thinking this may be a pit dug for research, you know, glaciological research, go into the layers of the ice. Uh, but we do, and I do recall from Howard's own tales, they certainly, they dug tunnels into the ice. Of course, you have natural refrigeration and freezing provided in great abundance in our <laughs> so never had to plug in a freezer down there, you know, you just dig a nice ice tunnel and store your supplies. Um, but this, this looks like uh, might have been a, a, a research pit or something like that. Um, during that time along the coast of Antarctica, Howard obviously had time to admire some of the really spectacular and exotic uh, landscapes or seascapes there. Uh, this looking like the edge of my shelf, actually. That's the beak. <coughs> yeah, right. Mind mm -hmm. the gap. <laughs> going to the beach and the you know, rope. Yes, and the ice axe, right. The, uh, the safety equipment there. Here, possibly an iceberg uh, breaking off and drifting up out there. So uh, again, bear in mind, this is all presumably austral summer. It looks like the sun's still relatively high in the sky there. Um, this would have been, see if you can focus a little bit, um, the remains of an old whaling station, I'm sure, uh, you know, which of course was what first brought sailors to Antarctica. 
and um, you know there are amazing statistics about the number of whales that were killed during that era. Again, a view here from a, a little snow-free bit, bit of the land, uh, looking out across the sea. Brian, I don't know if you know anything about this phenomenon where you have an area that remains free of snow and ice right on the edge of that vast experience of uh, rather spectacular. Most of stock basically. Now we're seeing the sun start to sink lower here. And Brian, were you there through the full cycle of a year or more yourself? Because, yes. you know, correct me if I'm wrong on anything I say about uh, how the seasons progress in the but I know it's a different world from here. This is a marker, I assume this is at the Scott base, this black. That no, it's further up the coast. Okay. It costs about uh, a whole day with a dog to go up to the mm -hmm. this is, and there's a lot of the uh, stores that uh, they had and, 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 and pick, get that food and bring it back. Ooh, right. And then uh, up here at you know, Captain Captain R. F. Scott, right. RN Royal Navy. Uh, is this at that same location in the site of no, the this former? This is on a, a mound between Scott Base and Metro. Okay. The, it's the spot where Scott actually expired. Uh, well, that's the this? record for him. I'm not sure if, if it's on the actual year, spot. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, so we have, we found among Howard's slides, uh, scenes of the various modes of transportation uh, he employed and employed generally, uh, that being the largest. Um, you know, version of the, uh, the snowcat or the treaded vehicle on treads. Uh, now, Howard and I shared many ski adventures together, so I know he would not have gone to Antarctica and not have gotten in a little bit of skiing. So, uh, soon probably more as a form of recreation than uh, practical transportation, but uh, they certainly did it. And, uh, of course, getting out on the water, navigating the ice, required ice-breaking ships. And um, provided by the Navy here, let's say. Uh, and even a uh, view here, what looks like uh, one ship being towed through uh, the ice by another. So I'd say I would spend a little time at sea there. Now, of course, airplane, I believe, and traveling from McMurdo <coughs> to Bird Station, say, uh, you know, might have been done by aircraft like this. I think that's more likely they flew a lot of their goods to Antarctica. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Here was one I wondered, these... Yeah. That's what we wanted to watch. Okay. So you have to repeat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I have a, a question about this. These containers look like they're being loaded into an aircraft. They say aerosol, and I'm a little curious as to if there's. It's a JDO. Which? For the taking out. Oh, the jet assisted takeout? Okay, so part of the aircraft's own uh, operation there. Yeah, well, thanks. That resolves a little bit of that. Uh, during one of Howard flights, you know, we passed over clearly this, this very beautiful dramatic mountain landscape. And uh, here, a little sign noting, uh, I assume this is located at a near bird station. Oh, they had a dog <laughs> on site. And it might have been the pole. By the way, so, oh. by the way, um, dogs have been barred from Antarctica under uh -huh. the Antarctic Treaty. Uh -huh. So now Antarctica is the largest no zone, no dog zone <laughs> in the world. No dogs allowed. Why is that? Uh, they were uh, considered a threat to wildlife 
Possibly. Right. Double penguins. Double penguins. Seals. <laughs> so one of the last. Now here, a little dark, but uh, this is the way they received a lot of supplies by airdrop, airdrop parachutes. Especially bird station being bird stations quite far inland, about 5,000 feet above sea level, and a uh, very remote spot. Uh, and here they are before they got them all unpacked. So they looked well provisioned there. Now, apparently, they found other uses for the parachutes after this. <laughs> <laughs> you notice this as a human being enjoying some kind of, some of the world's most exotic sledding. Uh, we assume they put Howard to work shoveling the snow off Antarctica. <laughs> uh, a task which I assume we didn't finish. Uh, and then here, remember the doles from uh, the very beginning here. There they are, finally having arrived on site. And it looks like they were still adding to or constructing you know, parts of uh, the, the station while they were there. And again, Brian, you you know anything about what type of equipment was in this type of dome? Or uh, that was a North Sky camera. Uh huh. Great. Yes. Would Pulse. you say a whole sky Pulse. camera? Whole sky. Whole sky. Yeah. Great. <coughs> this was uh, Howard's team at Bird Station. And was right. the next to one of the uh, IGY vehicles, and Howard himself here is. Uh, the fellow over on the left. I'm sure they got to know each other all quite well over the you know, dark one here. Uh, they obviously had plenty of work to do maintaining their equipment and vehicles. And now, once again, Brian, is a question for you. This, I would assume, is some kind of man-made explosion, missile, missile launch. We were wondering if it would explosive for seismic testing. Does that sound like any kind of research that you are familiar with? I'm not sure. Right, okay. Remains a bit of a mystery. We don't think that we're natural <coughs> geysers uh, <laughs> old faithful in Antarctica. Uh, this, I assume, from glaciological study, that looks like a mark for maybe a meter of depth, and you can see, of course, so it's... That's the one meter. Right, right, and all those nice layers in the, in the ice. In this. There's quite a lots of places where they dug down quite deep and to see how far the geology was of the place. Right. So he, he's saying they did a lot of measurements of the depth of the ice. That must be the Swede. Uh, <laughs> they either had a polar bear swimming event there, or I, I was kind of assuming they had some kind of a hot tub or access to heated water there that they did. So uh, the sun's getting low now, Howard's taking some shots, and again, Brian, I'd lean on you here. How long does a sunset last in Antarctica? Does, does this, is it like weeks or days? Well, it's when it's a season that's running all the way around. Right. But then it eventually will drop below the horizon yes. after the year. So, that, but that sort of golden glow of sunset doesn't last for days, weeks? something much longer than we're used to. Weeks or months. Yeah. So the right season. Prolonged uh, sunset and shifting into the Antarctic winter, uh, corresponding to our summer. So the folks in the station had a lot of time, uh, you know, to pass. And uh, they do appear to have been well fed. Uh, you know, Howard's uh, chowing down on something there. And uh, to have enjoyed getting their mail from home, I noticed down here, Alfred E. Newman of Mad Magazine. <laughs> and something called Rogue. It looked like Vogue at first, but it looks like it says Rogue. Maybe a jewelry magazine. Uh, communication here uh, looks like a radio setup, and I assume. Did you have communication both with other bases and back to? Yeah, back to all the stations, pretty much. Yeah. yeah, so communicating with each other here, well, you know, decor, a bunch of young men a long time in a remote place, kind of decor you might expect. Again, this 
equipment, of course, during uh, summer or winter, they are hard at work there making scientific observations, and we know are involved with seismology, glaciology, and auroral research. And so here's kind of the meat of what Howard was doing. These are his own photographs of the Aurora Australis. And I wanted to, here's a bit of a challenge. If anyone here knows the Southern Hemisphere stars well enough and can pick out a constellation in the background of any of these, feel free to speak up. Uh, that would be an impressive feat, I think. Um, it usually I, be a lot more colorful. It's Sort of uh, these, these are black and white images. Right. We will get to some colorful color in a minute. Um, I've seen a reference to the fact that this time period he was there, say, Austral winter 1959, uh, solar cycle 16 or something, apparently a time of high solar activity and therefore good for auroras. Here, this is a spectrograph, right? I know it's got a camera. Yeah, okay, and, okay, uh, so uh, this is one of the instruments. They were in color. Mm -hmm. So this is a black and white shot of a color instrument. Here, a little fuzzy, but that tower we saw on its side being packed up is uh, now in use there. Uh, so I assume that's the auroral radar. And they were certainly, uh, you know, doing spectroscopy here. I'm assuming, you know, studying the composition of the auroras, probably also, you know. That it's all the visible region. Right. Uh, then we get into Howard's, you know, some color views of uh, auroras, and he, he obviously found plenty to observe, you know. So again, the tower at the bottom of that one. So what exactly was he studying about the aurora? Well, you know, they were composition and um, location, distance, height above the earth, things like that. Those are two things I'm aware of. If anyone knows any more about that branch of research, you know, I, I'm happy to learn. Subsequently, you studied uh, something about the wind measurements. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a great, another great adventure, uh, but also serious scientific exploration Howard was involved in was uh, a, a, an 1100 mile expedition across Marie Birdland. And this is a very remote part of Antarctica uh, with a small party to, to map, to study uh, seismology, glaciology, and, and uh, gather more data on a relatively little studied part of the Antarctic continent. Uh, this in the austral summer of 1959-1960. Uh, uh, a little time to relax, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps. But I'm sure they were quite busy uh, with, with the planet on their plates, you know, the vastness of that landscape and that sky, <coughs> taking careful measurements. Uh, Anybody remember that dirty red jacket? <laughs> <laughs> I might have come home with Howard, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that before. Uh, they certainly encountered a lot of the masses, you know, and all the phenomena of glaciers and ice. And uh, this looks like a, a voluntary uh, entry. Uh, <laughs> so, well, there was a tragedy. There was uh, a, uh, in some of the information I saw, a death in the crevasse that occurred among some of the explorers down there at the time. And now, <laughs> right, right. Uh, not sure if this was during that traverse or not, but certainly an amazing piece of landscape there, rock and ice. And here, we're wondering if that's an actual volcanic eruption. Yeah, Mount Erebus. Okay, that's an eruption on Erebus. Yeah. <clears throat> now here we believe this may be Howard Laveau standing on Laveau Peak. Uh, Again, very remote location, seldom visited. And uh, I'll leave this up. This is, uh, yeah, I'll try focusing a little more. That's good. So this, there's the marker from a wee bird land. This map, uh, I know it's hard to see, but traces some roots of uh, explorations and expeditions of uh, Bird and Scott and, uh, and others who were down there. Uh, and when Howard uh, returned home, of course, Brian, you told us, he uh, returned via New Zealand. So uh, if the Antarctic adventures weren't quite enough, he then spent uh, some time exploring New Zealand. So 
as well. Um, so that's that's what we have on uh, Howard's time in Antarctica, uh, making a contribution to science, but also uh, you know, expressing his, his lifelong love and adventure. So thank you. If you have any questions, we may have more questions than you. <laughs> <laughs> right. I get tap the screen, right? I just tap the screen. Oh, it's not happening. Yeah. Give it a longer tap. There we go. And we want. Okay, welcome back. <laughs> Tom, thank you very much. And Gene, thank you as well. Um, I mentioned, in, I think one of the letters I wrote, the President's uh, message. I think what impressed me about this whole thing is getting to know Howard, like we get to know him now in some of his earlier years, is um, I knew Howard only from one picture of his life, and that was a, a frail gentleman in a wheelchair. I didn't know him when he was a younger person like you did, Gene. And uh, the first time when I saw the uh, obituary and I read through, it was almost like opening up a scrapbook. You know, what I have is that one picture of an elderly Howard, and now you got a scrap. Every written part was like an image, like a photograph. And uh, thanks to Eugene and Tom, we just opened up even more to, to see Howard in those earlier days. So we thank you very much for uh, coming and doing that. Um, I guess we're just about set. Chris is setting up the uh, refreshments. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, I hope you have a good, safe month. We'll see you back next month. And uh, if your car gets towed, have a nice walk home. <laughs> <laughs> Meetings adjourned. <laughs>